This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. ADHD, how is ADHD related to ASD, a lot about the PAT study and the diagnosis of ADHD in preschoolers and then some treatment in future directions. I think there's an important thing here that we all have to acknowledge and uh, I was just in a very uh, excellent talk next door about the DSM-5 that Sally was talking about, uh, the fact that the uh, differential diagnosis is important because the symptoms, impairments, and associated behaviors do overlap and short-term outcomes are sometimes similar, but the treatments, placements, and access to services vary depending on what your diagnosis is. However, you can be diagnosed with both now, which is a huge advantage. This was an early attempt at differential diagnosis. You've seen these books, okay? so. You can, you can get one out at the bookstore right now. And, uh, you know, puppies are very ADHD. I mean, that, you know, I mean, I think it's partly due to their whatever their 700% smelling is better than humans, you know? So they're walking down the street, like, oh, what's that? <laughs> Where, where's that? I got I to turn that smell down, you know? And, and, you know, oh, you're home, you're home, oh, you're home, you're home, you're home, you're home. You're home. You're home. So they're very distractible. Cats, however, I'm a dog person. <laughs> Shelly Curtis says, I am sorry, I wasn't paying attention to what I was thinking. She's, uh, I had to look her up. She's a, a, a soap opera director, uh, some famous soap operas that I don't watch. Stephen Wright's a comedian. I was trying to daydream, but my mind kept wandering. <laughs> I had to bring in someone with a lot of uh, heft, so Pascal once said, all evil is due to man's inability to sit still. If you ever had a hyperactive kid, you know exactly what he's talking about. <laughs> and then Francis Ford Coppola, I have AAD, where everything is remarkably interesting and all at the same time. <laughs> Here's a couple of really creative people who have ADHD. Ty Pennington is from that show, uh, what is it, Move This Bus, what do they call it? Extreme Home Makeover, okay? Th this is a great guy. He actually does fundraisers for ADHD. He fully embraces the fact that he struggled as a kid. He got treatment. He's doing, doing a lot better. And he attributes this to the fact that his mother took him to certain professionals, and they were able to get his thing under control. He's a, he's a wonderful man, a creative person. Uh, I've participated in several major fundraisers with him. He just gives a remarkable amount of time to, to this cause because he realizes how uh, early diagnosis and treatment makes a difference. And then this other guy is Michael Phelps, and his story is probably a little more familiar to some people because he is a little more famous, the Olympian, and again, his mother got him to treatment early on, and one of the suggestions early on was because he was so active and saw so many things remarkably interesting at the same time that she put him in a swimming uh, program, and the rest is history. Now, ADHD, the names have changed, but the children are the same. These are some of the names, historically, that have been associated with ADHD. Hyperkinetic disorder, minimal brain damage, minimal brain dysfunction, ADD with or without hyperactivity. If you look at this timeline here, uh, the first description of ADHD uh, that we find in the medical literature was 1903 by a remarkably named George Still, okay? I, I just love that, okay? But that is the first medical um, d description. There were descriptions in literature before this, back in the 1800s in Germany, because the Germans had a lot of cold winters and they sat around and observed people a lot. I guess they couldn't get out. And so we have Fidgety Phil from Henrik Hoffman back in, in the 1840s, a description of, of an ADHD uh, child. It got named minimal brain damage. People got uncomfortable with calling these kids brain damage. They changed it to dysfunction. And then we got some odd English person making the names of hyperkinetic reaction of childhood. And then it has come up to 2013, which is now attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. And, and that is because the attention deficit is primary. 
It's not the hyperactivity. It's the attention deficit that's primary. It's a problem with the attention system. So if you can't attend to paying attention to, to standing in line, you get out of line and you look like you're overactive. These are the core symptoms of inattention. Uh, only five are required, not six for 17 and older uh, in terms of, uh, of, of this list, which is a change for uh, DSM-5. And these are the core symptoms for impulsive hyperactivity area and only five, not six. And they've also added uh, five more new symptoms here. Okay, that's a DSM-5. Who is affected? Well, worldwide it's, it's thought to be about 6%, but in, in the U.S. it's 9.5% of children 3 through 17. 4.4% of adults diagnosed a lot more often in boys than girls, according to National Health Interview Survey 2011. Uh, there's an impairment everywhere. Uh, you can have, you should have, uh, uh, look at this as kind of a, a, a circle from children to adolescents to adults. So we start at the top. I lost my thing. Children, we have academic limitations, problems with relationships. Secondary things start coming in like low self-esteem. Uh, they get injuries on their bicycle. They get injuries when they're just driving. Then we want to know, do kids outgrow ADHD? So we establish there's impairment from this, and we say the hyperactivity over time goes down. The inattention over time does not, but remember that's the primary core deficit is inattention. The impulsivity, some people said it went down, but I am questioning that because I think we didn't have the proper probes and now we have some extra probes and we might see that the impulsivity doesn't go down because I have plenty of adults in my office who are very impulsive in, 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 in different ways, see? It's not like they're impulsive like in the childhood way when we, when we talk about the child, sorry, the childhood way where they're, they blurt out or they can't wait their turn or they interrupt or intrude. They're impulsive in the fact that they buy stuff they can't afford that they, they go from job to job or relationship to relationship. What causes ADHD? Well, it's complicated, okay? And anybody tells you anything other than it's complicated is not really telling you the truth or they're trying to make themselves look good or something else is wrong with their brain because it is complicated, okay? And I don't know that much about autism, but I do know a little bit about ADHD and it's complicated. And there's multiple etiological sources. It's highly genetic, but we know that environmental factors can contribute. We know that at a different level, we can see alterations in brain structure and brain chemicals. And we also know that, um, that you can have that final common pathway of someone who has ADHD after uh, an injury or after some other kind of brain perpetration. Uh, this is just to sort of like impress you that I like can put up some brain pictures, <laughs> but we actually did do this study, and this is a study that uh, we did with um, the National Institutes of Drug Abuse, uh, the head of National Institutes of Drug Abuse, her name is Nora Volkow, and Nora I think gave a talk here on Davis not so long ago. Uh, Nora is a very interesting woman, she's very bright. She uh, is the granddaughter of the Rus Russian revolutionary Trotsky. So Trotsky escaped Russia in 1917 with the overthrow, and uh, Stalin's people pursued him to Mexico City, and eventually he was assassinated there. And this is the house that uh, Nora grew up in. Her dad was Trotsky's son, and so she grew up in Mexico speaking uh, Spanish with a Russian accent, and now she speaks English with a Russian-Spanish accent. <laughs> and she talks about things like the nucleus accumbens, the hypothalamus, and some other $10 words. And she speaks really quickly because she's really smart. And every time I see her lecture, she speaks too long. I have to hold all those words in my head because she's got that accent that makes you keep long, longer short-term memory to get the context to know what the words are really talking about. And I have this huge headache. I learn a lot, but I pay for it. Nora uh, got us interested in doing some brain scans, and uh, her theory on ADHD, which I've come to embrace over the last few years, which at first I was sort of hands off about, is that it's not just an attention problem, it's a, it's a um, motivation problem as well. 
And so we're talking about some brainstem, um, midbrain areas here that are, are right next to each other, and they both are, are shown in uh, ADHD adults to uh, be deficient, and they're, they're also very heavily involved in dopamine. And uh, we took some, this is the, the, uh, the study that we just published, we took some um, adults who were newly diagnosed as ADHD and never treated. We treated them for a year with methylphenidate. And so what you can see is that the regions of interest there go from yellow to bright red on the top two, and the controls, they stay about the same. So we have no difference here, and we have uh, a, a, diff a difference there. So after 12 months, we have a retest, and what we're showing is after 12 months, we have increased the dopamine transporter density, which is a reflection of the fact that we have more dopamine activity in this area, and the dopamine activity in this area is known to be associated with attentional and motivational processes. So we've, we've actually been able to increase that with chronic treatment of, of one year. So uh, this was all scans that, that were done back in Nora's lab in Brookhaven, New York, but the, uh, the adult subjects were actually seen out here in California, and we actually flew them back for a baseline and for their 12-month exam. Heritability estimates are high. Uh, it's, ADHD is probably not as heritable as autism, but it's very close. It's, it's, it's in terms of a childhood disorder. It's the most heritable except for maybe autism. So if, if you see an ADHD kid and there is no ADHD first degree relative, you're, you're a little bit concerned because you expect to find an ADHD first degree relative. Um, if we look at the DSM-5 criteria for ADHD, it hasn't really changed too much. The only things that have changed is that um, you have to have um, symptoms present before age 12. It used to be before age 7. And uh, you're allowed to have a concurrent diagnosis with autism spectrum, which is something that we're going to talk about this morning. Now, DSM-5 only uses uh, two domains for autism spectrum disorder, as was talked about in the previous talk, uh, the social communication domain and the restricted and repetitive interest or behavior domain. This was the, uh, the deficits in domain uh, A. They have to be social-emotional, they have to be uh, nonverbal communication, and developing and maintaining relationships. B is the restricted one, and uh, the, new, the new one in the restricted one is number four, hyper or hypo-reactivity to sensory input or unusual interest in sensory aspects of environment. I only highlight like that one because that's something that we also see in ADHD. ADHD, it's, it's not super common. Uh, I, I heard the number next door that they get this in 70% of autism. That, that's like really high to me, but we might see it in, in uh, uh, 10 or 20% of ADHD kids. They will, they'll see this, got to cut the tags out, or they don't want to wear socks, or they hate the loud noises, that kind of thing. Uh, all of these criteria we see in ADHD. Every one of these we see in ADHD. Okay? Now, it's not the same quality that you see in autism, but we see it. All right? Now, why is that? And then the symptoms must be present in early childhood, then they must limit and have impairment like before. Well, I think it's partly, if you look at this kind of conceptual framework, what we're talking about is the fact that autism is based on this and this, and you can see ADHD Overlap. So if this, if you look at this as kind of a 3D, it's, it doesn't really show 3D that well. But if you if you look at this thing building on these bottom areas, okay. So these bottom areas, and on top of that we have autism and ADHD and you know other kinds of things. So if we say those core deficits at the bottom is what the problems, uh, or how the problems interface with each other, and then what we call it is if you have a certain combination of these problems, we call it ADHD. But as Sally said in the talk yesterday, we're not really good, or yesterday, last session, before lunch, seems like yesterday. Um, <laughs> we're not really good at sort of carving nature at its joints. There's so much overlap. We would like to say this thing is A and this thing is B and never the twain shall meet, but we're not able to do that. You know? So we end up with, with a little bit of a mess. So, 
The mess is because children with ADHD and ASD have similar challenges with behaviors that are associated with communication deficits and social impairment. And it's impairment in these areas there's thought to be due to these underlying problems with both self-regulation and attention. So ADHD kids don't make good eye contact. They don't. I mean, that's like a hallmark of ADHD. And you say, well, that's what we know about ASD. Well, I know you know that about ASD, but we knew that about ADHD a long time ago. The reason that ADHD kids don't make good contact is twofold. One is they don't want to disengage with whatever the heck is they're doing when you call their name. So I've got mothers that say, yeah, the only way I can get good eye contact with him is if I take his chin and I move his face, and then I know he's paying attention to me. Now, they don't have attention-orienting behaviors, but that doesn't mean they're not paying attention. They hear everything that's said, but they don't orient. They don't make that eye contact or that postural contact. The PATS preschool study, well, more on to these points later. Uh, the PATS preschool study, uh, the preschool ADHD treatment study, was done at uh, all these university centers. So at Columbia University in New York City, uh, the, the place is led by uh, Larry Greenhill, who's uh, uh, been there for many years and uh, has been uh, very active in uh, child psychiatry. At Johns Hopkins, it was Mark Riddle. At NYU, it was Howard Abacoff. At Duke University, it was Scott Collins. At UCLA, it was Jim McCracken. And at UCI, it was myself, uh, Jim Swanson, and my wife, Sharon Weigel, uh, leading up the uh, effort for this study. This is complicated. I just wanted to show you that I knew how to do a complicated slide. <laughs> Basically, uh, we, we, we uh, recruited uh, these uh, preschoolers. This was back about, about the year 2000, who were between three and a half and five and a half. And they had to go through, as you can see, quite a few different uh, hoops and hurdles to, to get into the study. Uh, the primary aim was to determine the safety and efficacy of methylphenidate, that's the MPH there, in preschoolers with ADHD using optimal dosing. Our primary outcome measure was a composite score formed from two rating scares, one from the parent and one from the teacher. The parent was called a CLAM and the teacher was called a SCAMP across the dose conditions in a five-week crossover phase. So I'll tell you a little bit more about what that means. All right, so. In 2000, the, the, the politics of Ritalin haven't, haven't really changed since, uh, uh, since forever. I mean, I can remember in the 80s, uh, the Scientology group picketing outside uh, one of our meetings in Atlanta, okay? And Tom Cruise is a big mover and shaker in Scientology. He supposedly was ADHD as a kid. He didn't like the fact that his doctor, parents, medicated him, whatever. He's, he's like totally against it, and Scientology is totally against it. And so much of the chatter about the dangers of Ritalin is from the Scientology group. I apologize if you're a, a Scientologist here. I'm not, I'm not saying that you believe that if you're a Scientologist, but I'm just saying they have an agenda, and they are behind a lot of these websites that are promoting the, the, the problems with Ritalin. Now, that doesn't mean that medications don't have problems. Medications have problems. Medications have problems in the sense that they all have side effects. Side effects are just effects on the side, effects that we didn't intend to be there. But more people die from aspirin each year than Ritalin. Not just a few more, a lot more, okay? Like 500% more, all right? But we're not trying to get aspirin off the market, all right? Why not? Well, because aspirin is a good drug. And if you use it safe, it helps a lot of people. Well, Ritalin is a good drug. If you use it safe, it helps a lot of people. That doesn't mean it's right for everybody. But there is no question that it's a safe drug. We have had published studies on the safety and efficacy of Ritalin since 1937. It's been better researched. That's 76 years. It's been better researched than any other drug used in childhood. There's no question this is a safe drug. However, it still is open for a lot of criticism. This is the history of ADHD formulations. 1937 was the first one, as I, as I, as I mentioned. 
all the way till 2013. We have a new one, which is liquid methylphenidate. So uh, methylphenidate is Ritalin. Uh, amphetamine is, is Adderall or Vyvanse. Um, we're also uh, in the midst of, of, of doing a, an amphetamine patch right now. That, that uh, There was a press release a couple of weeks ago that it passed its, its phase two trial that was done with us, and uh, it's gonna go into uh, phase three for FDA approval. Um, as you can see, there wasn't much going on until 1996, right? So in 1937, they used amphetamine. In 1950, they came out with Ritalin. Uh, Ritalin was named for the wife of a scientist at Novartis who was working on the product. So um, they were trying to develop Ritalin during World War II for the purposes of keeping the, uh, the army guys who had to like watch the sonar awake because you have to like continue, it's a, it's a, it's a you know, persistent attention task. So you have to watch for a long time. They were giving them amphetamine, but amphetamine had too many side effects. So they were trying to come up with an alternative. Well, we won the war and so the research stopped, okay? But then Novartis picked this up in the middle of the research project, and there, there was, uh, 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 this was actually in Italy, it was a branch of Novartis in Italy, and the guy named it after his wife, Rita Lynn. Rita Lynn was a tennis player, and she was, she was willing to be his guinea pig to see if it helped her focus and concentrate more on her tennis game. Just a casual tennis player, I mean, more, maybe more than casual, but she wasn't a pro. But she reported back, yeah, this really helps me with my tennis game. I'm able to focus longer and stay you know, on point longer. So it got named Ritalin. Ritalin. Uh, and then nothing. They came out with Pimeline in 1970. They pulled it off the market because of some kidney uh, issues with that. So they, they, they stopped using that. In 1980, they came out with a sustained release methylphenidate, and it just didn't work very well. It was like. It was like Ritalin wrapped in a waxy matrix and it just came out in an uneven fashion and it depended on whether or not you ate breakfast or the acidity of your stomach. It just was terrible. But in 1996, they came up with uh, uh, an orphan drug that was called Olbatrol. Olbatrol was uh, a failed um, appetite suppressant. So, Richwood Pharmaceuticals uh, saw this orphan drug, meaning that the, the original manufacturer had given it up, so anybody could like investigate it. There was no patent. And he thought, you know what? This might work for ADHD. And of course, it did. Now, it's interesting because it was originally developed as an appetite suppressant. So the side effect to an appetite suppressant is you pay attention well. Now, when you call it an ADHD drug, the side effect to that is an appetite suppressant. It's the same thing, but we label it differently depending on, the drug didn't change, but it was a failed appetite suppressant because after a few weeks or a few months, it didn't suppress your appetite anymore. So they couldn't make money on it because too many people adjusted to it and it no longer suppressed their appetite. As an ADHD drug, People adjust to it, but not everybody adjusts to it, so some still struggle with the appetite suppression. What was meant to be the primary effect is now a side effect of the same exact medication. And then Concerta came along. So we, we developed, we helped them at our laboratory at UCI. We helped them develop Adderall. We helped them develop Concerta. Concerta uh, is, is a sustained release of methylphenidate that's so much better than the old idea of a waxy matrix because these guys up, uh, actually they're over, over by, uh, um, by Stanford. Uh, they, they developed this um, release system called an osmotic release system where they made a tiny little pill, oblong shape with a razor, laser hole in the top with two different push compartments that as liquid leaks in the top, the drug gets pushed out at a measured rate. So we did this study, which we called the sipping study, because we had different percentages 
of Ritalin in different cups that kids would drink all day Saturday so we could get the percentage right to put in that push compartment for the FDA to approve to get put on the market. And so forth and so on, and everything on here, every one of these drugs we have uh, investigated at UCI. Some of them we were the primary lab involved with it, others we were the secondary, but every one of these has come through UCI. All of these drugs have made billions of dollars for people other than me. <laughs> Pat's eligibility, three years old to five years, six months, consensus diagnosis of ADHD, combined or hyper impulsive type on the parent disc in a semi-structured clinical interview. Now the parent disc is a, is a uh, computer-based question interview and the semi-structured clinical interview meaning they talk to me or, or another clinician there at UCI. The, the important thing to note here is there were no inattentives only. We did not allow the inattentive only subtype to get into the study. Well, we probably, uh, were, we did this because we were, we were afraid 13 years ago even though we were the experts, we and the other five university centers were the experts, we were afraid of our own ability to diagnose inattentive only in a three and a half year old because what are three and a half year olds? Inattentive. So we said we need to have evidence that's really clear from that behavior side of things, that hyperactive impulsive. So we let in probably all combined. Some of them we called hyperactive impulsive, but they were probably combined and the inattentive stuff was just so difficult to measure that, you know, that they were probably all combined. The CGAS score was less than 55. We had an IQ score of 70 or, they need to be 70 or above. They must be in a preschool because we wanted to document impairment in two settings. The pretreatment is interesting here because the pretreatment was a complete 10-week co-parent training session. So again, remember the politics of Ritalin. It wasn't looking good to say that the government is funding a study drugging three-year-olds. Okay? That didn't, that didn't, that wasn't like the politically correct message that needed to be sent. However, the reason we did the study is because practitioners in the community were drugging three-year-olds. This was what the impetus for the study was. So many out in private practice were already drugging three-year-olds with no data that the government said, we need a study. We need to know what's going on here because it's already out there. And the reason it was already out there is because there was pressure from these preschool teachers putting on these parents to put their pediatricians to write scripts so that their kids wouldn't be so dis uh, disagreeable in the preschool. Because this is when this whole thing movement started about the kindergarten readiness test, right? Have you heard about the kindergarten readiness test? Like, shouldn't you just be able to take a nap? Shouldn't that be enough? <laughs> I mean, I'm old school, I know, but now, if you don't already have your number concepts and you have your letters and some reading ability, they don't want you in kindergarten. And in my day, it was like that was the stuff that you learned in kindergarten. But now, of course, the stuff that you learned as, uh, you know, in, uh, as a bachelor, for your bachelor's degree, they teach you in high school. I mean, it's, you know, it's this whole push towards if you're not in the right preschool, you're never going to get into the right high school, which will never get you in the right college, which will destroy your life. <laughs> so there was pressure on preschool teachers to teach these kids their number concepts, their color concepts, to teach them pho pho uh, phonemes, and their circle time was being disrupted because you had these preschoolers disrupting the circle time. And the teachers were being judged as to how many of their kids are going to pass the kindergarten readiness test. So they're saying, your kid's out of my preschool because he's not, I, I gotta get my kids ready for the kindergarten readiness test. So the mom says, oh, I can't, you can't kick him out. I, you know, I'm working, I need, I need help. What do I do? Well, go see your pediatrician. So the pediatrician's like, well, I, what am I supposed to do? Well, they would write a script. So all of a sudden, millions of preschoolers were on ADHD medications with no research data on what's the right dose, what are the side effects, how is this metabolized? What's the outcome? 
Nothing, nothing was out there in any kind of systematic way. So that grant was awarded to us because we needed to collect that data. But we said we we're gonna put them through parent training first because maybe we can solve the problem. They don't really need medication. Now the purpose of the project was to look at the effects of medication. But if we can help kids without medication, that's what we would rather do. Again, back in 2000, the program with the most evidence-based for a group setting was something called COPE that was done by Chuck Cunningham and McMaster's University uh, up in Hamilton, Ontario. And so this isn't one of our actual COPE groups. And so we have a facilitator, that, that fellow who's walking around there, and we have families sitting at tables, and we had topics that we would go over that were behaviorally based that they would meet with us once a week, they'd have homework, they'd watch little videotape vignettes of what's going on. Uh, this was a standard format, everything was manualized, that we were trying to help these parents with these ADHD preschoolers handle the problems without having, quote, unquote, to go to medication. So, as I said, back in the year 2000, this was one of only two possible programs that had any evidence based from a group perspective on handling these kinds of issues with preschoolers. Th just nothing was out there. So this is the one we chose. Chuck Cunningham came down from Canada, he trained all of our people in how to do it, and we did it. So, this is breaking down of that really, really, really complicated slide, it's still a build slide. So, we diagnosed 303 preschoolers across the six sites, so approximately 50 per site. All right. Now, some of them, you know, as, in, as all these big studies go, some of them start dropping out for different reasons. So, we had 261 of 279 who actually entered into the COPE program that finished the, po the, the COPE program. So, uh, 24 or so never even got to the beginning of the COPE program. It was a difficult program to implement, uh, a difficult protocol to implement because it was done in groups, and so you had to get these people through, and then they kind of had to had wait, see, because you had to have enough to put into a group to start the group treatment. So some 24 people across the six sites, about four per site over the years, they just couldn't wait. They, they just couldn't wait for the group to form, or they had some other issue come up and they dropped out, they never got there. So. Then we said, who improved enough after the COPE to meet, we had, we'd made a criteria for improvement that, that, that would say you've improved so much, you don't have to be, it doesn't mean you're normalized, but you're doing a lot better. All right, 19 improved so much that, that they, they, they didn't have to go any further. Uh, however, f seven were lost to follow up. So what does that mean? Maybe they were improved enough, they didn't want to do it anymore, but they didn't follow through. But this is over several years, so you would lose some people. 52, however, interestingly, chose not to continue. So even though they didn't reach our arbitrarily defined improvement, in their minds, they've got a handle on things. I don't need to keep going, okay? So when you really look at you know, what, what, how, how much this intervention worked, you could really make an argument to combine the 52 with the 19 and say, even if you didn't meet our pre-established criteria, the parents felt the kid had improved enough, they had learned enough about behavioral techniques that they were not gonna continue. So our aim was to allow parents to opt out of the PAT study if parent training was sufficient. That, that was what we were trying to do. We didn't want anybody to go into the, to the treatment phase unless they really, really wanted the medication. So, we did some baseline tests, in, in, including getting genetics, which is another talk. And um, then we did an open label safety trial for a couple of weeks. So in other words, we just exposed them to a low amount of methylphenidate, just from a, totally a safety point of view, to see if they could tolerate the medication, all right? A few of them had adverse reactions, and they discontinued. Okay, but again, you have that with all medications. A few people will have adverse reactions, right? I can't take penicillin. It's my particular 
constitution. I have to take erythromycin. That doesn't mean penicillin is a terrible antibiotic. It's a great antibiotic, just not for me. All right? Those kids who couldn't tolerate the Ritalin, if it was in regular clinical practice, we would have tried amphetamines on them, and that's what you do. If the Ritalin doesn't work, you try the amphetamines. If amphetamine doesn't work, you try the Ritalin. Then we did a, 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 a five-week uh, trial of a double-blind titration, and then we randomized them to a best dose where the, for another three weeks where they would be compared against no medication uh, but a, in a placebo pill versus the best dose that we found out in the five-week trial. So that ended us with 165 kids. It was about 75% boys. Their mean age was 4.4. They were 63% Caucasian. Maternal education is what we measured because there were some single families. 53% uh, were college graduates. Their, their IQ score was about 97. And as I said before, we had only combined and hyperactive, and those were the subtypes. Their impairment was, was fairly severe of 46, okay? Uh, if you, go, if you go, low, go below 40, you probably would not be appropriate for this trial because you're so disruptive that we wouldn't be able to control you. So it's pretty severe, and that's, that's an important point to remember. These were severe kids. I was talking at lunch with, uh, with uh, a couple of my old students here who have graciously come to hear me talk after they've probably heard me more than enough times in their life, but they said, they reminded me that I was describing one of the, the kids in my office 12 years ago because he was literally climbing my filing cabinet using the little old pull things to step up to the top. And I'm behind my desk saying, Mom, Mom, <laughs> oh, he'll be fine. He does that all the time. <laughs> this is what we did to characterize the sample. Uh, the, the important part on this slide is that we had a consensus panel. So we, we reviewed this data. We, were, we, we got on the phone with the five other clinicians at the five other sites, and we all talked about it. There were a lot of comorbidities. ODD was number one, all right? Communication disorder, now what that's primarily phonological or receptive expressive disorder, a few mixed, uh, and the other ones, and so forth and so on. This is a typical clinical presentation. Early onset, mom's reporting motor restlessness at age two, very aggressive, hit students, threatened teacher, expelled from the preschool. Uh, this wasn't the worst one. We had one that was expelled from six preschools, four and a half years old. Okay. No sense of danger, according to the mom's report, turned on the electric stove and then just stretched out over the burners to take a nap because he wanted to warm himself up. It was a cold day. Climbed onto the table to swing from a ceiling fan, call it an energizer bunny, likes to sing a lot had frequent temper tantrums, meltdowns at least three times a week or more. I asked mom, what's a, what's a meltdown? I, I, I thought, you know, you just said he has a lot of temper tantrums. Are you talking about, so, oh yeah, this isn't a temper tantrum, this is a meltdown. I said, well, what's a meltdown? You know, I, I, I thought that was what a temper No, a meltdown is when he goes in his room, he locks the door and he throws stuff out the window. That's a meltdown, okay? Frequent accidents, he had run into a chair because he's just all over the place and turned a corner into the kitchen and you know, the chair that's always there associated with the kitchen table was the irresistible force, or the immovable object, meaning his irresistible force. His developmental milestones were lagging for language and fine motor coordination. He had some kind of apraxia going on. The parent disc, which was what our ADHD symptoms were recorded on, he had all hyperactive impulsive symptoms, and seven out of nine, you know, even as, as a, uh, a five-year-old. Rule outs, things that we considered ODD, CD, anxiety disorder, and autism. However, we gave him none of those. So the comorbidities, even though he had some things indicating all of those, we didn't give him any. The mother herself said she's undiagnosed ADHD and attentive subtype. She says she's never been diagnosed. The dad had an alcohol problem. His C-gas was 48, pretty typical, pretty low. His IQ was 97. His teacher score was a 26, which is pretty high. So we put these kids in, we did their dose response, and what you can see is a pretty linear effect that says this is, the, this is their, uh, 
the behavior rating score, so higher is worse, so this is better. So what you can see is uh, uh, as we aggregate these numbers, uh, you put them on just a very little Ritalin, they get better. You put them on still a very small amount, they get better. You get to what we would call a small amount, and they get better. And then when they come up to 7.5, you know, they're the best. We had a nice linearly orderly relationship with the effects of the Ritalin on the behavior ratings, whether it was parent or teacher. There's two lines there because the parents are on the top and the teachers are on the bottom. All those are low dosages, okay? Those dosages are 1.25 three times a day, or 2.5, or 5, or 7.5, okay? Those are low dosages. 10 would be a medium dose if we did 10 three times a day. So those were the best dosages that got assigned. A few did get up to 10, all right? And then after that, we put them in the monthly open best dose for 10 months, all right? 140 did that, 95 finished it. Now what was interesting here is from the beginning to the end, their dose went up during that 10-month maintenance period. So as a group, they entered into the 10-month maintenance period with a dose of about 14.2 milligrams. That's what the first red dot there is. And then it went up to 20.5 at 10 months. The side effects were interesting because we had different patterns, okay? These, these things, uh, crabby, irritable, prone to crying, tearful, sad, depressed, listless, these things, uh, the listless line doesn't come out to it. All these things went down during maintenance, okay? And that's even more impressive because if you think about them, they went down while the medication went up. So these things are decreasing in the face of increasing medication. You think if you increase the medication dose, your side effects would go up, but that didn't happen. The side effects continued to go down, all right? So s several of these things are, are behaviors more connected to preschool, and so preschoolers in general, so they're being less crabby, less prone to crying, less tearful as they age. So they got captured as side effects, but they're really what preschoolers do. And the medication is either controlling them better or they're growing out of it because it's going down while the medication's going up. It's the opposite relationship that you would expect. These were common side effects with no significant decrease. These are things that we think are true side effects that we should be worried about with preschoolers. Appetite loss, picking at the skin, trouble sleeping, being worried, anxious. These things stayed level, all right? They didn't, they didn't decrease. And then we had some rare side effects that, were, that, were, that, that happened sometimes, and, and these are things that you have to worry about. That's why you look at, for every single kid, because an individual kid might have some of these, but they were, they were fairly rare. Stomach aches, which I was surprised to find rare because it's more common in school-aged kids. Social withdrawal, motor tics, uh, a, a, a buccolingual movement, which is also kind of like a tick thing, and headaches. Stomach aches and headaches we do see, but we, in, in, in uh, grade school kids a lot, but these preschoolers may not have been able to report them as well. So we, we were surprised to find those. Um, we want to talk a little bit about uh, an important side effect, which is growth suppression. These are like your standard growth charts, and um, the pediatrician would fill one of these out every time you come in the office and find out where your kid is on the line or off the line. And the, and the point here is that between baseline and uh, 14 months later, these kids were dropping off their line, okay? They were 1.95 kilograms heavier than expected when they started and 2.11 centimeters taller than expected when they started. So they were expected to be a certain height and weight based on their age, based on CDC norms for the entire population. So we took in kids who were taller and heavier than the normal CDC prediction, and they got shorter and lighter due to the treatment. If we just look at, the, at, the, um, at a percentile here, they, they started at a 0.6 percentile, or 73 percentile, which is a z-score of 0.6. You don't need to know what z-scores are, but they're just a measure of, the, of, of, of your uh, height compared to normal. And they, they ended up basically close to average. So over the, over the time of treatment, they went from being a heavy kid, so this would be like a, a normal, I mean, a tall kid, I'm sorry, this is about height, a tall kid to almost average size. Okay, 
This would be the average size. All right, 7% improved after COPE and 23% non-interested in methylphenidate after parent training. So we might say that 30% improved after COPE. Okay, so parent training worked on a third of them. These were very severe kids. All right, the evidence based on COPE at that time was not based on very severe kids. It was based on moderate, mild kids. So probably 10 weeks isn't enough for some very severe kids. All right. The methylphenidate dose of 14.2 point after double blind increased to 20.5 at the end of maintenance. So we probably were very, I know we were, we were very conservative. We put them on the least amount of medication possible. They probably did need to be on more because we ramped them up, you know, fairly quickly in 10 months. The effect size was smaller than seen in older children from our MTA study. So the drugs worked, but not as, not as huge, but may, maybe because of the fact that we used you know, a lower dose. The significant side effects were seen in a, about 30% of the kids, and 9% of the kids decreased, or I'm sorry, discontinued due to side effects. And overall, in that time, we lost a half an inch of height and three pounds. Uh, another study I'm just going to mention really quickly, uh, this is still, I think, the only uh, study from preschoolers that we looked at the clearance rate of the methylphenidate out of the system, and because preschoolers have more immature systems in general, their clearance was, was, was much uh, slower. Questions for the next study? Well, we'd like to confirm the range. We'd like to confirm the, the, the thing I just told you about the delayed clearance, confirm that stimulants slow growth facility, and maybe use more intensive uh, parent training as, uh, and at the same time as medication. That, we would like to, like, the MTA study was designed that you had a group that did both at the exact same time. And here we did one followed by the other. So when you do both at the same time, we got in the MTA study 68% of those school-aged kids being rated as normal after the, tr after the uh, treatment. You couldn't tell the difference between, uh, 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 we, we sent observers into the classroom who didn't know which kid was an ADHD kid and which kid was a control. They couldn't tell the difference two-thirds of the time. But those were the ones who had parent training and stimulants at exactly the same time. Those who had only, par uh, only parent training, it only worked for about 34% of them, about half. Right? Those who had only medication worked for about 56% of them, a little more than half. So combined, we think would work the best. The UC Davis Mind Institute was created in 1998 with a promise to find cures for neurodevelopmental disorders. Every day, our physicians and researchers come closer to fulfilling that promise. Their groundbreaking research on autism, fragile X syndrome, chromosome 22Q11.2 deletion syndrome, ADHD, and other brain disorders are helping children achieve their fullest potential. Please visit our website to find out more about current studies, upcoming events, and how you can help make a difference.